Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll selfishly be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. Open Invest is an innovative Melbourne-based investment platform, giving Australians access to investment portfolios managed by the world's leading investment managers, including BlackRock, JP Morgan, and Schroeder's. It's ideal for clients and prospects you can't support via traditional financial advice-led portfolio management. Or, if you have your own well-resourced and experienced portfolio management team, Open Invest can customise their tech to give your firm its own digital investing solution, your brand, your portfolios, your content, accessible directly from your website by general advice. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with John Woodley. John has been in the advice industry for uh, for a long time. He is a coach, advisor, and executive chairman at Fitzpatrick's. Uh, he's been in that business for 23 years, a lot of that time in the CEO seat. Um, Fitz started as a business about 35 years ago um, and ran predominantly as an advice business. And then when John joined, um, they've looked to expand that business with with other like-minded uh, advisors and, uh, yeah, grow it into the, the beast that it is today. So, John, thanks for joining us, buddy. Uh, my pleasure, man. Mate, I thought a good place to start would be to talk about a little bit of the evolution of the the business, and I suppose how it came about, how you 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 got involved, and and some of the progression from there. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Look, I guess some of the uh, some of the, the where Fitzpatrick's has got has been an accident, and some of it has been a something that's been close to mine and Scott's heart even ever since we got together and started to think about what we could actually do and build together. So Scott Fitzpatrick being the uh, the namesake of the firm, and, you know, really my um, really partner throughout, yeah, essentially. So, you know, really the formation was that Scott and I getting together in separate bus- advice businesses and just sort of talking about advice and how it could be and sort of working through that and wanting to do things a little bit differently, especially in the high net wealth space, even back in the late, uh, it would have been 99 at that at that point in time, and how things needed to be done in our businesses a little bit differently. What actually happened from there was other advisors who were actually seeing what we did or who, you know, who were friends, saw what we were doing and sort of said, hey, can you coach, can we advise that way? They had problems doing that within the frameworks that were around at that period of time, you know, you're talking, you know, to year two, late 99, et cetera. And so they would start to say, hey, can you coach us? Can we do it your way? We'd say, hey, we need a license. You need a license. How about we do that? And then we sort of formed and started to collaborate together. And we just sort of grew, grew from people who were attracted uh, more to the way that um, we were giving advice and would coach them. And so we, we sort of progressed through that. But at the beginning, Scott and I had a vision of a national professional advice firm uh, about being very client-centric, really focused around those objectives about being very professional. And so Fitzpatrick's has just continued to develop along that path and that same core vision and values that we started it with right back in the beginning is still there and it's still the same vision about a national private wealth firm. It wasn't about uh, services to advice businesses. It wasn't about that. It was always about the actual advice business and how you can give great advice to that. You know, and we were focused on that high net wealth um, market. So, and we just evolved like that uh, over time. So that's that's really the progression there. And what do you? One of the things that we've been focused on in my advice business over the last little bit is is building out a, a more private wealth focused solution mm-hmm. i think um we've seen a 
I think it's somewhat of a, a natural progression that I've observed with thin advice businesses that they build more of a reputation and it p- might start out of interest. It might just start at the clients that they get exposed to. And obviously, yeah, the more the more people have got, the more value you can add from a bottom line perspective as well. I'm interested to unpack, like, how did you guys go about building that solution and, and how has that changed over, the, you know, what's been decades that you've been doing it? One thing that hasn't changed um, when you're in that space, it's what I call a uh, very much a relationship business, not a scale business. So it, it, in, in that it's, it's professional, it's, it's what you call a margin, a relationship business. I'll give you an example is that, you know, your approach to technology in that type of business is different how others might approach technology. So in a private wealth business, the way I would view technology is how does technology help me be more human to my client, whether in other businesses people are looking to technology to do more of the delivery, all right? So Mm. they're looking to do more of the service and the advice proposition, and I go, well, and to be more efficient. I'm not really necessarily thinking about efficiency so per se. I'm thinking more about how can I add more into that relationship around that client, that specific client that I really want to be a hero to or that I really want to serve really well. And then that anchors all of my strategy around how I grow businesses. I'm having to look at that client and going, hey, what do they really need and how can I be a hero to those top clients I've actually got and actually um, and really focus how I build things around that. But it's all around the relationship. It's all around that advice. It's all around how I can help them have more capability, confidence and direction in their life. And then we sort of work it back from here. So I don't know that it's been rocket science, but it's been <laughs> because you've sort of been really at that end and you really understand that this is relationship business. It's a margin business, so therefore not highly scalable business. And therefore, it's a high skill and high capability business. And therefore, it's all around. It's it's more of a professional services style um, strategy and professional advice style strategy than it is around a wealth business building strategy. Okay, they're different types of businesses. And so when you get clear on that, you go, well, and, and if as a business, I want to be in that business, which is very different. Well, then your delivery of services, the way you turn up, um, how you engage is differently to a general wealth business. So Yeah, it's in, it's interesting. I know that my experience from we have just randomly had exposure to, um, uh, I suppose, clients in, in that, um, you know, the eight figure plus levels of, of wealth space. And I think you've hit it bang on that you can't, really have a in in the rest of our business it's like this is the approach and then you know we do these three meetings and they go for this amount of time mm-hmm. and then the things that we cover but i found that if that all just goes out the window when it comes to these people because the things that are front of mind for them are different and the the the, the situation tends to evolve reasonably quickly as well obviously you got a ton of experience in that space so is while there's uh, i'm guessing that there's probably not a you know, a, a definitive, um, consistent, like, you know, cadence and, and approach exactly. Is there a, is there a standard sort of, yeah, I suppose, process that you would take people through or approach that you would take to, to onboarding a client like that? Asking you more with your advisor hat on now. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I think that's really important, um, especially, you know, especially around uh, really good professional firms, they they have a way of back going to it. You know, you have a look at any national respectable professional firm called the Deloitte's, et cetera. They have a way of back going, how they turn up, how they interact. And I, I do think that that's consistent. And, and like in that first time you are engaging with people, it's what are you engaging around? So not taking my agenda, my service offering, my proposition or my value at all to the engagement. Now I'm a little bit different then, and I think people who are attracted to Fitzpatrick says, I sit down as a servant to the client, not with a, you know, and that's very different. So when I'm engaging a new client, come in and go, well, how can I help you? Number one, right? It's not about my proposition, so, or about my process or anything like that. It's about the client. And it's just like, well, how can I help? Am I 
And that's a professional engagement. You think about when you go and see a lawyer or accountant, you sit down and then they sit down with a blank piece of paper and go, how can I help? They don't sit, sit down there with a, a service offering or anything like that to offer you. Mm. They sit, you know, it's a professional engagement. And I think that's the important thing to sit down there and be confident, hey, I'm going to serve you and if I can't, through my network, I'll be able to connect you and that's great. So, And then it's really, um, for me, in that initial engagement, really having a, a, a framework, a great um, skill set and actually asking the questions and really staying with that and not trying to solve anything and actually understand and in our world and our professions really at the answer is answering that what that really one question which is where do you, you know what are you trying to achieve and can we help you get there with the minimum amount of risk i mean that's the real question is in that process having a good framework where you stay and really understanding what the client is really needing before you move on to finding out facts before you move on to helping them articulate in a manner that's safe to them the, their future reality or their, their committed future, however you want to term it, you know, and that's really where we've got to get to is that in my profession and my role, how, how I see my role, now there's different technical advisors and everything like that. I'm not talking mm. about this, a very general speak. I'm just saying, hey, you know, helping you actually, that you know, I, 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 articulate your, you know, your committed future, what are you committed to, and then sort of bringing our way back. But having that, I think it's really worthwhile having a structured way where you get to that without jumping in too early, without trying to solve right. issues, without trying to advise. It's, I sort of have a view that a lot of advisors I see in coach and mentor, they probably over-advise and under-question and so staying in that question mode as long as we can and helping the client feel really comfortable that, you know, in all the time I've been advising, there's only been really one person who's really been financially well organised according, <laughs> according to their committed future. And it was a lawyer from, um, I think it was Gundawindi, right? And so, and I've advised uh, many partners from some of the biggest accounting firms and legal firms and they're not well organized so how do you get everyone to feel comfortable and let their guard down to talk about their committed future in a way where they can sort of express that that's a skill and that's that's i think a little bit at the heart of the profession of don't start to show how good you are or how technical you are until you actually understand that committed future and those so hold off <laughs> Um, as long as you can um, to move through that until you have a good understanding. So I don't know whether that's what you're asking, Ben, but that's, you know, really engaging with those people who have complex needs or yeah. complex, complex to them. Um, how, do, how do you sort of get there? Yeah, look, I think it's interesting that that's it's one thing that is um, consistent with, I think, high net wealth clients uh, or private wealth clients or whatever label you want to put on that. And... Um, like all regular sort of retail clients or non high net wealth clients to mm. say it that way, that that does very much ring true. I think particularly important given the level of complexity with the more stuff going on and more dollars to deal with. However, I think that for people, anyone that's in a, a reasonable financial position, which is, you know, almost um, now with all of the changes in advice is almost the only people that can afford financial yeah. advice. So the people that advisors are talking to that there's a lot of different ways to be right. And the best, the best decisions for them typically come down to like, you know, what's important to them. How do they want their lives to, to move? Like how do they want them to progress over time? What, how do they feel about different levels of risk? So they, I think it is natural that we want to help people. That's what a lot of advisors that they, they come into this game or stay in this game because, because they do love to help people. And it is really easy to jump into that solutions mode. But um, yeah, I think very, very true to, to, ask more questions um and and listen first and i think people take a lot of that out out of that in itself but, but obviously that place is better to support 
uh, clients better as well. Look, I am keen to talk about some of the insights that you see from, obviously you see inside a lot of advice businesses through the work that you do at FITS, but I do have one last question just on the high net wealth space um, mm-hmm. before we get there. What if for, for advisors that are listening in that, that m- might be keen to move more into this space or create a solution for um, the bigger end of town, what would be the top three things that you say, that you think that they should be you know, thinking about or do to give themselves the best chances of success there? Well, number one is probably realise um, uh, the, the value that our profession actually has right? and, and really actually contemplate and actually understand that. So a lot of advisors, I, I think, um, can package up over time in businesses. Um, you're, you're talking about the people who might need advice or take advice from you, but not, not just a lot of people have it sorted, right? So... But the people, you know, where I'd sort of start with is really actually understand the utility of um, advice done well, okay? It has a real community value. And when people really understand that, hey, what I do, if I do it well, has a huge impact on the community through, you know, helping people leave those more enriched lives. So I think that's number one at the heart of it is actually understanding the value that a, a truly equipped and capable advisor can actually make and that it's not a second-rate profession and that there's huge opportunities there for, to do that and do it professionally and that they can and that they can be proud about that. That's that's probably one. Actually understanding the client, if you want to be a profession, it's a um, it's a profession, right? So you're you're it's a, it's about the art of the profession and the love for it and the difference that it actually makes. And in that, I think it's important to have a good understanding of who you serve, serve well and who you serve best. All right, so there's enough people out there who need our service, and there's lots. And it's really understanding who you serve well, where it's good for you and it's good for the client and it's you know good for your staff and it, it's that concept of profitable growth for all. It needs to be profitable for the client, profitable for me as a professional and my, my team and everything. Mm. And then actually understanding who you serve and who you love to serve and who you're curious about. So that makes a great advisor. So I know when I am advising, I still do do some work, you know, I know, but it's at a different level now and my engagements are very, very much at a different, but I'm so curious about what I'm involved in so interested in because if you're going to do it as a profession if you're going to do it for a long period of time you've got to love you know your um your leisure times your work a lot of the time so it, why not really be curious about the people you're with and and that really makes you a, a great profession because you get more interested in the people you serve know who you serve know who you're speaking to would be certainly number two on that and the, the third one is uh, just try and do only that, right, <laughs> um, would be to, to, I just get so many people to see them get distracted by doing this and that and serve this and that and what if I built this and do that and this other service proposition. Mm. And I'm sure there's a lot of noise and, you know, as a profession it, it comes down to knowing who's uh, knowing what that client wants and then really competing for talent in your team. Okay, it's a, in a professional service, you'll compete. One of the things you are, you're competing for talent. So going looking for great talent to boost your team so you can actually serve the client better. So they're probably off the top of my head, Ben, three things. I love it. And um, I uh, talking of talent, I, I think obviously as a, a business where you're working essentially as like a coach and you're partnering with advice businesses and mm-hmm. running licensee services as well, you guys end up uh, and you've, you know, grown considerably since the, mm-hmm. since the time that you joined that I know that it's not the same in terms of, um, you know, it's not the same as an advisor employing someone directly in an advice business. But I think Fitzpatrick, you, Fitzpatrick's as a business, you're known for the the quality of the advisors and the businesses that you do work with and, and partner with. So, I'm interested to hear someone that's hiring myself, and I've I've been you know massively trying to upskill in this space and and figuring out how do you find the right people, onboard them well, all of those things. Um, what it, what have been the 
how do you make sure that you're getting the the right people firstly and then how do you go about setting them up for for success in the partnership that you guys do end up with together look i, I think sometimes it, it's really you, when you know you're in a competition for talent taking lessons from other profession uh, other professions and the way that they go about it they're always seeking that talent and how do we be attractive to that talent now and then how do you communicate your culture? So in professional services, we all have a different culture and a different way of being. It's how do you communicate to the other person so they can self-select a little bit? <laughs> okay, so there's there's that element. But also communicating your passion and communicating, hey, what's important here and all of those sorts of things for the other person and what's the service. I do think the people are the, your most valuable asset. Right, obviously, it's you have a look at your P and L and everything like that. It's all it's all about people, and when we get clear on that, really developing our own skills as leaders around how do you how do you build and, and enrich the lives of your team, and how do you build that capability? And it is one of your key roles that you actually have in leaders of the business, and and ultimately, it's your highest leverage point. It's your almost one of the highest things that you actually do other than seeing the client obviously if you've got that dual role but it's just identifying talent and then actually developing the skills of how to identify talent i don't know that i have a a uh, a set process or a magic wand over that it's just important Are you sure? because that would be really <laughs> helpful that, that would it's, be incredibly it's, helpful <laughs> it's you no, know, just you know. I just say, look, it's one of the most important. And going forward, if you're a leader of the business, it's the most important thing you do. Developing capability within your team. It's the ultimate. I know a lot of business strategies, and even uh, only wealth, but outside wealth. When I ask people, what is your business strategy, clients, and etc., and they'll go, well, it's to grow EBIT by this and do this, and I go, well, that's not strategy. <laughs> Okay, what is your strategy of actually how you grow? And once they anticipate like that, the ultimate leading activity in the success of your business, especially our firms, is do you actually measure how you're actually building the capability of your team, your people? That's the ultimate. That's the thing you should measure, not your P&L. If you measure that, you know it turns up in your P&L later through great client experience, through great service, new services offered, and great client experience, then it turns up in your PL only when you deliver that. And the way to do that is develop great capability in yourself and in your team and start to measure that. Um, and with with recruiting, I just say, you know, I, I don't know any magic way about it. just get good at it. Just work out, just go and practice, just go and get good at it because it's one of the key capabilities you need to have. And maybe there's lots of other people you could go to work out that magic formula and everything. And and there's lots of services that can help you with that. And I just say, you just need, as a leader, you just need to get good at it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you've got to build that muscle. And I, th I would say that it's probably even for advice like i know at the moment I, my time is is a bit split between growing the business and and still supporting some clients but i um i i don't take the client work that we do lightly but i i think the team building is probably the most important thing because the yeah. more i can support the team the better that they can support the clients and um as you say yeah, it drives that growth I know that you guys do, you know, with the advisors in your network, that a, a big thing that you do is help them to to grow and support the growth of, of their business. And you mentioned there that building capabilities within their team are, um, you know, is a key driver or a leading indicator of that. How how should people go about tackling that or other others within their businesses or what are the what are the key key things to be aware of? how they go about developing their people is that what the question was about? yeah building capability within their teams is there i suppose it is yeah. somewhat different depending on every business and individual but are there you know is there is there an approach that you found works better than others there yeah certainly uh, for the leader of the business to commit themselves to their own leadership development number one okay they're at their own ability to actually do that within their team that would be where i'd start you know i know quite regularly at the beginning of every year so i have a routine in my diary where i lock away for the year all my thinking time or strategy time throughout the year you know it's 
so many days at the beginning of the year, so many days a month, so many hours a week. I'll lock that away so I can have thinking time. But I know every year when I turn up to my January thinking time that I get a little bit upset because I go, oh, damn, I've got to ante up again and change again myself. I've got to improve again myself because I actually know that um, – if I focus on that and I have a passion for that, the people like attracts like is that the people around will have a passion for learning and a passion for curiosity and, and those sorts of things. So, and then just to sort of speak about it, give people opportunities. So, you know, I always saw performance reviews when I was doing them, I would never see performance review as the, the review of my team. I would see a performance a review of, how well is, am I serving and the business serving you to be the best that you can be? So let's actually have a talk about how you can be the best you can be and let's let you review me in that light as a leader and the business as a leader. How, how are we helping you be the best you can be as a, as a as an advisor or, or a member of the team? Now then let's just flip that around and have an honest conversation about what can you do to be the best you can be and where can we actually sponsor your improvement and have a lovely, honest conversation about it and not get caught up too much in the noise that can surround these things because really the context of this is how can we both help one another? So I love it. Start with, start from the top, lead by example and, and filter it yeah. through, I think, yeah, makes yeah. It, makes a lot of sense. John, you guys obviously see inside a lot of advice businesses through the through the you know the work that you you're doing. Yeah. Um, what what have you found makes the biggest difference to those that do really well and those that don't? Yeah, a couple of things is um, less is more. It, it really comes down to that less is more. Uh, so really understanding who you serve well. Uh, restrict the amount of people you're going to serve <laughs> a lot of the times, okay, so you can serve mm. them all and, and sort of grow through that. Don't get caught up into the bigger and more is better. So know who you serve, know your positioning, know who you're speaking to so that you speak to them well and you serve those people well. That cuts out a whole lot of noise and inefficiencies in these businesses. You stop doing and getting distracted by new widgets come out, new technology that comes out, all of these other sorts of things. And because if you're in the higher net wealth space and you want to be in the professional business, it's a low people business. It's a margin style business. The impact, you know, as I said, well, I'm not sure of my huge technology needs if I've only got 30 clients. Okay. <laughs> I'm not mm. sure what that. I'm not sure it's a real scale piece, and and so, but I don't say that it, it has application and it has huge application. But it's the mindset around what's important and doing less is more. Knowing who you speak to, I like the idea of restricting how many people who you are going to serve, and it's not an endless piece. And it's not an endless um, show. There's not endless tickets. <laughs> Because that actually means that you really value the people you bring on board as clients or even as team members and you just put a lot more effort into making sure they're a great fit because you don't have endless seats for that. And so you're making, therefore, you're having a really honest engagement with clients, especially is, is it good for you and is this good for me? And then can I add value and can you add value and the expectations around that? And we're, we're really looking at that this is an investment of time, not just what I can get or what fee I can get. So that's it, it, less is more would be I spend a lot of time with people just saying, hey, come on, let's just actually just focus on what you can do really well and uniquely. Let's get clear on that. And then let's actually build around your positioning around that and, and how can you communicate in that in a way to the people who are going to hear that and get permission to speak to them. And then you can actually start to build out from there. And then there's a whole lot of stuff you don't do. Like I've never done seminars. I've never done all of these other marketing activities because I know my clients will come through current clients and through my yeah, through my close relationships that I actually have with other professionals and that's where they come from. So I don't need, all I need to do is serve those professionals well and I need to serve that well so I don't need to do a whole lot else. 
Yeah, I think that sometimes um, advisors and business owners, you can feel pressure that so there's a lot of noise out there and people are saying, oh, you should be doing, you know, whether it's seminars or on, yeah. you know, Facebook or any number of things. And I think that you've got to find where the people that you want to talk to are and or like where do you intend yeah. to get your people from and then build your strategy around that or, as opposed to trying to think that you need to replicate what, um, yeah. what someone someone else is doing. It's a good point, Ben. It's different different marketplaces, different people, different advisors, but you're exactly right. You probably articulated that better than I could. It's just yeah, really knowing, knowing where they are and being able to speak to them. Uh, I think that saves a, a lot of time and inefficiencies in business and not getting distracted by all the new widgets and ideas and things out there. Mm. It seems to be that, that there's a lot of that. Absolutely, yeah, and I I love the uh, comment as well around limiting clients because I have found that as I've been growing my business, there have been for a long time it was a, it was a matter of we want to work with more people than than we currently are, so we, we're wanting to attract more people in, and then um, it sort of got to this bit of a tipping point, and then we had more people that wanted to work with us than what we could have. Um, that we can work with effectively and efficiently. And given that that was the first time that that had happened for, for me, I was like, oh, great. And then we just like, where do we fit these people? And, you know, we put them in. But that was a mistake in hindsight because I realised that it meant we, it put our team under a lot of pressure and it yeah. meant that in order to meet our, our service standards that um, – you know, people were yeah having their nose to the grindstone for too long. It probably caused a couple of people to get burnt out and didn't do good things for how our, our ability to focus on other things in the business that was going to set us up to support our clients better in the future. And yeah. I think that turned into an issue. And then I said, well, okay, well, what is, let's figure out what our capacity is. And then we go, okay, well, we can deliver, you know, this number of new clients, this number of yeah. reviews. And and then we've got, you know, the certain number of team there that can support that. And what that for me, what I found was when we focused on that, I started saying, oh, hold on a second, we need to actually look at our service packages here, because if we're only working with, you know, 10 new clients a month or whatever that number ends up being, then and, and if every advisor can only work with, you know, 120 clients mm -hmm. or whatever that number is, you say, well, okay, well, it needs to be, if we're, if we're looking at making sure that the business is going to be sustainable and we are going to be here to support these clients in the future, then we need to make sure that we're getting to, to a certain revenue threshold in order to do that. And it really focused for me and for the team, I think, in terms of, yeah, like you say, what we, what we should be doing more of and what we should be doing less of. So I think, yeah, yeah this it's a, it's a, it, it, and it's really quite interesting. I remember really early on, I uh, don't know where it picked it up from, but uh, uh, I certainly didn't invent it, but I took it on and I've always kept in mind the advantage of you, you and your professional business or in businesses like ours over like an institutional business um, is it sort of comes down to is the process for innovation and meeting client needs, which is what innovation is about a lot of the time. So, mm. And I, I love that thing. Well, if you want to know what you should build, go and ask it. Go and ask the client for the check. <laughs> and if they give you the, and if they give you the check, you know it's valuable. If they don't give you the check, don't build it. And if they do give you the <laughs> yeah. check, use that check to go in and work all night and work ever and and back yourself before you ask for the check. You you got to understand that your team can deliver on it, even though in the beginning it's not going to be there or clunky or anything. But, but what you do is know how you can then build your business around that. You know what you're doing is meeting a client needs. So therefore, it's worth the investment of time. So often I see businesses come up with these beautifully designed packages and et cetera. And I, they go, this is a great service. I'm going to deliver this. We're going to deliver that. And I'm going to deliver this. And I know when I'd ask the client, do you value that? And they go, no. <laughs> No, no. Can, you, that. can you can you actually file that lovely little review package that you can? Can you put that on? You know, that's out of me. Can you actually put that in my drawer here? I'm not taking it home. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've definitely been oh, so, so asking the client really what they value and having that conversation. What, what's the matter with us? Is asking the client directly. Hey, this is what I'm thinking. Would you pay for that? Mm. And or even that's if you MVP yeah. something, I think as well that we we've um, 
done things in the past and it's like oh we'll create and we work with a lot of younger people and we're we've got a fair bit of technology in our business and it's like oh we'll create a, a members portal and we'll put some yeah. educational content in there and that'll be great because then the advisor is not going to have to explain these things and you know we're having this conversation day in and day out but what we found was that people want that conversation like they don't yeah. care they don't want to go go to some members portal and, and watch video but in you know in certain circumstances i know that that does work for some people and and some businesses and some clients but for us it didn't so it's like we launched the thing but then we looked at the stats and said well okay this is not effective so let's not not put the energy there so sometimes i think i think that that if you can get them cut the check first or if you want to try something make sure that you keep in mind that you could you want to be able to measure who's actually using it and how much they using it so that you can see is it worth resourcing or with time money or team um and, it, in the and i think in, in the professional you know i just go through and I, one of the things i keep coming back with the, the, the clients that you're wanting to advise to to one of the lots of things that they're looking for but one of the key things they're looking for is they want to know how to think about all of their problems they don't necessarily want you to do their thinking for them or provide the information for it or anything like that they actually what they they want them they want to have the capability themselves to have more so that they can work out hey how can i improve the direction of my life how can i have more capability and more confidence but it's their capability not our capability so you know we're sort of thinking about those conversations you're talking about with these clients what's actually going on is they're learning how to think about these things so when they go away they're more equipped between when they catch up so my goal's always been how do i make them less dependent on me <laughs> not more dependent on me having to ask me the questions having to ask me the come back to me all the time my thing is how do i equip you and how how can i help you think about this more so that you're you're more capable to create a bigger future for yourself without necessarily being dependent on me but we can mm. you know and then the relationships based around that um you know growing those bigger futures together so you know how do i actually connect with them and have more of those conversation essential conversations with the client rather than more stuff you know i don't mm. know that they need more stuff i love that and i think it does help the client to ultimately build more confidence in what they're doing because at the end of the day i think they still want to know that what they're doing is the right thing so if they can think better about their problems or know how they should be thinking about them then that's great but it doesn't i think that there's sometimes there's a fear that it does that mean that then the, the they're not going to need us or want our support but i think that when but, it's but probably then how, how, how good would it be if they didn't right that, i mean ultimately you, you sort of think about how good would that be if they, you could equip them enough and that they could go out and mentor other people and then there'll be there's lots more people to walk in your door that actually need that and mm. then you got known for really helping people have more capability and things like that and, and true true advice and equipping and so you know that's one way to look at it it's a little bit different to how we would standard look at it but uh, it's it's as an advisor it takes a lot of the stress out of advising oh well hang on <laughs> It's not about making you dependent on me. It's about helping you create, you know, make the changes you need to make. Not I'm not I'm not making the changes. You're you're making the changes. Yeah, I love that. It's a it's a it's a great philosophy, and I think that practically as well, like it takes time for people to get to that point. So yeah. you build a good relationship, give a great result to yeah. someone. You've probably got an advocate for life, and then you've got someone that can go spread that message to to others. Yeah. So. John, thank you so much for sharing your insights. So much gold there. I'm sure we could we could keep chatting all day, but I know that you're um, you're a very busy man. So really appreciate you taking the time. Look for people that are keen to learn more about what you guys do. What's the best way for them to to find out more? Look, I'm sure on the website or something like that, they they uh, <laughs> sort of connect through. I'm sure that there's a there's something they can do there. But see, look, contact me. That's fine. Um, I assume you can find a way to through how to do that, but uh, it's been an enjoyable conversation, Ben. Thanks, John. Mate, appreciate it again for sharing your insights. Um, yeah, we'll catch you next All time, right. team.